what, where we've been is we've been doing this prayer series and I was uh, basing it off of the Lord's prayer. How the Lord said, when you pray, pray this way, right? And he said, our father, we preached a message on our father about the intimacy between the father and his sons. And the word of God says that you're a son if you're born again this morning. You have to be born again, you know. And I've mentioned this many times when I witness to people outside the laws of the church. They're like, but we're all the children of God. And I know y'all heard me say that, but that's not true. We're not all the children of God. We're all the creation of God. Right. But to those that believe on his name, to those people that believe on the name of Jesus, that accept Jesus as their Lord and say, to them he gave the power to be called the sons of God or to be called the children of God. Yes. And so, so there's an intimate relationship between the father and the children. Amen. So our father who are in heaven. While it seems like he's far away and he's sovereign and he's holy, he, he's really right here. He's right here waiting to, for, to hear your cry. He's waiting to hear you call upon him, right? Hallowed be thy name. He's holy. He's altogether separate. Amen. And then we got into this part. It was divided into two. It was your will be done. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Part one. The individual. Today is part two, and I'm titling it "God's Kingdom: The Bigger Picture." Okay. And so, when it came to the individual last week, I had three main points. God wants true conversions. Amen. Let me just talk about that just for a quick second. God want, wants humans to be converted from their first birth in Adam. It's important that we understand that. That when we were born in Adam, we were born into sin. That's what the Bible teaches. That all of humanity was born into sin. And, that, and so the Bible teaches that in order to become a child of God, you must be converted and you must be born again. Amen. God the Father sent Jesus to the, the righteous one. And listen, that second to last song that we sang, blameless, you see me right, holy, I'm, I'm messing up the words, righteous, uh, spotless, you, you know, holy. You know how many chapters in the Bible that, that covered? Do you know how many verses in the Bible that covered? Like, I, I wish I, I should probably just preach the song. I mean, I'm just saying, like, that was the book of Leviticus. That was the book of Romans. That was, it was everywhere. It was the whole gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. And, and there's a story in there that'll tell you what God has come to do. And so he wants true conversions and he wants people to, to truly be able to be born again. We got to understand that when a person is truly born again, a miracle happens in their heart. Amen. When you say yes to Jesus, a, a miracle happens in your heart and you're, you're convert, you're transformed on the inside. The Bible teaches that when you become born again, the Holy Spirit moves into your heart. Everybody around you is not going to understand that. And something that I've learned through the years is it's not really it's I, I thank God for what he's that he, what he's done in my life through the years, because I used to be very concerned about what people thought about me. I, and I'm not saying that it, I still don't need help. I'm just trying to make a point. I've moved in a certain direction to where a lot of times I really just don't care. what it. I know what God has done for me. I know that there was a day when death was arrested and my life began. New life began. And I am so forever grateful for the work that he has done in my life that, listen, I just want, I just want to tell somebody about Jesus. So he wants true conversions. And then number two, though, the cross is an ongoing work. Yeah. The cross continues to work in your life. Right. If I could say it like this and try to make an illustration, the cross, it's, a, it's an instrument of death. When Jesus died on the cross, he broke the power of sin. And when you become born again, he, he, your, your faith in Christ has forgiven you of sin. But, but you still have a lot of flesh. You, you still have a lot of self. You still have a lot of you that remains. And the Lord wants to crucify the you that's separate from the him. Because the word of God says that he wants to fashion us and conform us to look more like Jesus instead of ourselves. Because, see, flesh and blood cannot enter the kingdom of God. And we really cannot accomplish anything in the spirit realm for God as long as our self is in the way and still. And what, what do you mean by that, preacher? I need you to get a little bit more clear. Okay, there's certain things in the scripture that are that clearly state that it's not God's will to live that way. Amen. And when we see those things, but my flesh rebels against it and says, no, I want it. 
I was having a conversation with somebody the other day and they were like, well, why do you think that people that love God still do? And what was funny was that there was a child nearby and there were some cookies involved in the child at that moment when the question was asked wanted a cookie and was kind of starting to throw a little bit of a little bit of a fit over the cookie that they wanted the cookie right and so the question was asked why do you think people that love God now this is not the a total answer this is just a quick illustration okay why do you think that people that still love God still do think I want cookie <laughs> I want cookie. I want what I want. Even though sometimes it's contrary to the word of God. That's why the, the cross is an instrument of death. And it's a progressive ongoing instrument of death. It's like a chisel in the hand of God. Tap, 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 tap. Fat or, a, or a scalpel that circumcises the heart, the Holy Spirit through the word of God. Removing flesh, removing cells. And fashioning us like a potter on a piece of clay. So, so again, he wants true conversions. Because look, you can, we can raise our hand in a church service. And I'm not the Holy Spirit. It's not my job to figure out who's truly saved and who's not. But there's many people that have raised their hand in the service and said yes and prayed a prayer. But when you know you're saved, as Ephesians 1.13, my friend. It says you get sealed by the Holy Ghost. When the Holy Spirit moves on the inside of your heart, you are not the same. Yeah, you can ignore it. You can, you can try to ignore it, but the Holy Spirit will convict you and he will draw you by his spirit, amen, to, to, to come back to him, right? And so not only does he want true conversions, but he wants the cross to be an ongoing work. And look, he wants you to understand and be able to believe what the Bible says about you. Praise God. What the Bible says about you, that you are a new creation in Christ Jesus. Praise God. And then you have a new identity. You're not the old man that you were born into, but you're a new man in Christ. Amen. And so that's what he wants you to know. And listen, the third thing that I preached on that last message about individuals and the, and the will of God had to do with this, that he is fashioning a body. The Lord is fashioning a body upon which he can place his head. That's a spiritual concept. But the Bible teaches that Jesus is the head of the church and that we're his body. And so listen, the body's not the same if Miss Sue's not here, if Chris isn't here. And y'all be praying for Chris. You probably don't want me to say it out loud, but their house caught on fire. And the Lord, the Lord's gonna turn this thing around into a blessing. He already is. But they need grace and they need patience. Right to get through the trial, amen. And, but, but it's not the same if Chris isn't here, if my brother John isn't here, if Joey's not here, because we're a multi-membered body, and God is really wanting us to. And my sister Yvette too, I love you, sis. I know she's over there pondering. You're right, brother. We need patience, and 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 so. But He's giving it, right? He's giving the grace. Praise God. He's so good, amen. I can't and we can't do it without Yvette for sure. If we're a multi-membered body. Right, We're, and, and that he's putting us together to work in unity. I don't mean to re preach messages we preach in the past, but if you cut off your hand, then you're not fun. You can't, you get the point. You, you, we end up with a bunch of severed body parts, and the Lord's wanting us to learn how to walk in unity so he can find a place to place his head, which is authority, so that he can speak to us, so that he can move through us, because he wants true conversions. And he wants an ongoing process of you dying to self so that he can use you to reach others out there. Because people, listen, contrary to popular whatever is being preached out there. I listen to some preachers, but I'm careful about who I listen to. Okay. And I don't know what everybody else is preaching, but I've heard or I've seen in the past that that people don't like to talk a lot about sin or they don't like to talk about things that they think are going to make people not want to come back to church or make people feel convicted and feel feel bad. And, 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 and at the same time, the whole world is is separate from Christ without a true conversion. They're, they're going to hell. That's what the Bible teaches, that people are going to hell, but that there's a the good news is that they don't have to go to hell. The good news is that God, the Father, gave his only begotten son and that whoever would believe in him would not have to perish but could have eternal life and God wants the people that you work with to know that God wants the people in your families to know that you can't try to do it in your flesh 
because you'll mess it up. But if you'll pray and you'll allow God to do the work in you and allow the word of God to get on the inside of you and the Holy Spirit starts stirring that up, I'm telling you right now, it's going to come out. It's going to come out somewhere. Hallelujah. And it's going to begin to effect change in the people that you're around. I believe that. that that's the word of God. That's why I believe that. Amen. Amen. And, and so he's fashioned in a body. A, a body. Amen. So the emphasis of this message, this is part two. I said it once, God's kingdom, the bigger picture. And, you know, sometimes we say this, right? We say, man, I have a lot on my plate. Amen. And it's true. I don't know about you, but sometimes I feel like I have a lot on my plate. But let's try to take a look at God's plate this morning. That's where I want you to kind of view this message from. And listen, I understand that God's plate God's angle of how he views the world in the Bible is much bigger than my little mind can imagine. I understand that. But I'm, I'm, I'm trying to give you a snapshot of how I see it as one preacher, how I see in this particular message. Does that make sense? Because, you know, God has called it if, 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 you know, someone else in the house got up and preached a message, even though they preached truth. It may not come out the same. It's not going to come out the same as the way I preach it. Some people focus on healing. Amen. God's a healer. Praise God. No, you're already healed in the name of Jesus. Okay, praise God. Some people preach on deliverance. You're, we're, we are already delivered. Amen. Hallelujah. Jesus already delivered us when he died on the cross. But that's the emphasis of their message. I have to tell you that I have to come to the realization of what God has broken on my life and showed me. And this is one of the things in this message he's shown me. I got a lot going on, son. And there's a war that's raging and people don't realize it. And he broke in on me whenever I was least expecting it. And he began to show him, not just me, there's countless thousands of preachers out there that he showed these things to. But about 10 years ago, he broke in on my world and he started to show me things in the scripture that I had never seen before. And it's things that are going on in the world. And he made it very clear that it's my job to communicate that message and to prepare people and to provoke people. To provoke you, to provoke myself, to understand that this, that God's got a bigger picture and there's bigger things going on than just ourselves, than just our, just our little life that we're living. And I don't mean that condescendingly. I'm just saying our life is small compared to the big picture. Yet at the same time, God is very concerned about our lives. He's very concerned about our individuality. Amen. All right. So. Based on that, let's try to take a look at God's play. And, and first of all, I want you to know that God is engaged in spiritual warfare. Amen. He's looking for believers to grow past self, right? So that they can engage in the war with him. I guess I could have given it a subtitle, maybe because this is kind of like active duty. Amen. God wants people involved in active duty. And, you know, we cannot see really what God is doing without his help. Amen. And that's the point to my introduction, because this is still intro information that I'm about to give you. The point to the introduction is that we would be able to see what God sees so that we will pray God's will. If we can see what God sees, then we can better pray God's will. Whenever we go back to the to the prayer lesson last time. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven for the individual. And we understand God wants true conversions. And we understand that the cross is an ongoing work. That can enter into our prayer life whenever we begin to pray selflessly and say, God, do the work in me that needs to be done in me so that you can use me to reach others that are out there. I had somebody text me this morning. I'm more worried about about lost souls being saved than I am, uh, you know, about whatever the production that a church puts out, something kind of like that to keep it, to keep it simple. And, and, and that really needs to be our heart not, that we would be focused on what God is doing. Amen. And so if we could see what God sees, then we will pray God's will. And that was that for the individual that we would say, Lord, please change me and do a work in me. Right. And so through Jesus and the new birth, we're able to now see I need you to know that because that's what Jesus told Nicodemus. Whenever Nicodemus, the religious leader in John chapter 3, came to him and he said, Rabbi, Rabbi, look at all these things you go do. Surely you're from God. Jesus said, verily, verily, I say unto you, unless a man is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. 
And then he said, and he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. And Nicodemus said, how can a man climb a second time into his mother's womb? Jesus said, no, it was born of the flesh is flesh, first birth in Adam, born in sin, but was born of the spirit is spirit. New birth, born again, new life, new creation, all passed away. All things have become new. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. And now you can see. But if you're not careful, you'll go getting blind again, spiritually speaking, all right? In Luke chapter 17, you know, we're not going to turn there. I'm just going to tell you. He was demanded by the Pharisees when, when the kingdom of God was going to come. And, and Jesus said, answered them this way. He said, the kingdom of God comes not with observation. Now, now listen, sometimes you can't observe the kingdom of God. Listen, there's gift of miracle. Somebody lay hands on somebody, their fingers will straighten out. They'll get up, they'll walk. Sometimes people's eyes that were physically blinded, amen, by the grace of God, a miracle will happen right there at that moment. And that person will can receive a healing that it will be manifest in the physical realm. Sometimes though healings take time as we stand and believe God, praise God. And so those are observations. Sometimes somebody will give a prophetic utterance. They'll give you a, a, a word of knowledge. That's, a, that's an observation. You can see the kingdom of God. Demons cast out of people. That's an observation. You can see that. Signs and wonders. But Jesus said the kingdom of God comes not with observation. He says, neither shall they say, lo, look over here. Lo, look over there. He said, why? Because behold, the kingdom of God is within you. Jesus said the kingdom of God is within you. When you get born again, the spirit of God moves into your spirit. You become one with the spirit of God. 1 Corinthians 6, 17. And the kingdom of God now is on the inside. of you. Do you believe that? You need to believe that. That's what the word of God says. That's not Matt Abraham. That's the word of the living God. And when God moves in, things change. Listen, that means there's power in you. The same power that raised Jesus from the dead now will quicken your mortal body. He'll give life to you, power to you. There's nothing that he can. Our problem is that we don't believe God in his word. That's our, usually our problem. So not only is it power, but it's a powerful responsibility. Now, I didn't mean to put a bunch of heavy burdens on you, but I'm just saying it's not just Pastor Matt that's got this responsibility because I'm not the only one in the house that has the kingdom of God living on the inside of me. No, you, if you're born again this morning, you have the kingdom of God living on the inside of you. OK, and so that means that God wants to move in you and he wants to move through you. Right. One of the things that I was thinking is, you know, faith and commitment to God's kingdom and God's work on earth with pure motives will yield an eternal reward. Whatever that looks like. Whatever you feel like God's calling you to do for the kingdom of God, it can yield eternal rewards. Okay? Uh, it will yield eternal rewards if it's done right. And, and one thing I do want to say is this, is that releasing the seed of the kingdom that is in, in you reproduces after its own kind. I know we've been talking about this a little bit, and I don't want to belabor the intro, but look, when God created Adam and Eve, he created them in the image and likeness of God. And God's intent was that they would reproduce after their own kind. God said that he made everything with seed within itself, that it could reproduce after its own kind. But then man fell. And when he reproduces, now he reproduces with a sinful nature. But now in Christ, praise God, in Christ, hallelujah, in Christ, you become a new creation. The spirit of God is on the inside of you. And when you begin to give the gospel and people are converted and people's lives are changed through the work that you're doing. Now you're reproducing after the image and likeness of God. But let us not be confused, child of God, saints of God. God is not OK with us continuing to live a blatant life of sin. Listen, I'm not going to sit here and list off a whole bunch of sins, but let me make it clear. God wants to move by the power of the Holy Spirit. He wants us to get our hearts right. He wants to provoke you. He wants to provoke me that we would get our hearts right. It's his work. He's the only one that can change us, but we need to want to be changed. Amen. If we think, listen, I, I'm not going to go preaching. I think it's Acts 17 where Paul stood on Mars Hill. But he just entered it into my mind. And then there's one little spot in his message when he preached on Mars Hill to the philosophers. He said, God ain't winking at sin no more. Right. He's not winking at sin. He's not closing his eyes to sin anymore. He sent Jesus. It was a very, very powerful move that the Lord made. Very powerful. So that not only could we be forgiven of sin, but that we could be empowered to live above 
the fray of sin. The Holy Spirit wants us that we, God wants you and I to have the fear and awe of God on the inside of us. No, 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 no. Listen to me. Sin will destroy your faith, child of God. It can destroy your faith. Does it mean that every time you sin, your faith is automatically going to be destroyed? Yes, it will. It'll put it in there. But it doesn't mean you can't make it back. But what I'm trying to say is you are taking a chance. I am taking a chance when we open up a door to sin. That is prideful. Lord, help us. You're looking at a preacher that's done it. So don't sit here and think that I'm beating you up. I'm here to tell you, Lord, help us. Be careful with this vessel. Don't be just playing around with sin. You can destroy your opportunity to live for God in eternal life. I, I believe that. I believe that. And, and listen, we only got one chance at this, friend. One day we're going to stand before the Lord. <laughs> Amen? One day we're going to stand before the Lord. And when we stand before him and we see his face, we're going to be there if it's good. Only because of the blood of Jesus. It will only, you know, my brother told me he went to a conference with a bunch of preachers and he met this dude. Then 40 men slept in a, uh, in a, in a uh, cabin in the mountains. 40 preachers. And, 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 and he said, he said he met one guy that was saved in, a, in a, a prison in England. And he told him, he said, son, remember this. There are no good, what, how do you say it, John? No good men. There are no good preachers. There's only a great God and a great gospel. Praise God. No, hallelujah. Isn't that true? No good men, no good preachers, only a great God and a great gospel. Lord, help us. Get our hearts right. Amen. All right. Let me keep going here. So, but there's a return, an eternal reward for those. So whenever this king, the seed of the kingdom it, it reproduces after its own kind, I want you to know this. The reproduction of the image of God is your created purpose on earth. That's what you and I were created to do. Listen to me. You were not created to be the best nurse practitioner. You were not be created to be the best uh, metal worker. You were not created to be the best doctor, lawyer, the best whatever you do. You were not created to be the best athlete. No. You, you were created. If, if the story is real, God is real, and the story is real, you were created for the express purpose to reproduce in order that God's image would be visible on the earth. And now in Christ, God has not changed his mind. He won. Jesus said this, I am the vine, you're the branch. If you will stay connected to me, then you will bear much fruit. God wants you and I to stay connected to Jesus that we would bear fruit. Amen. And seed within fruit reproduces after its own kind. Yes, I want to produce some Jesus fruit. Amen. That's what I want to do. Lord, help me to do that. Amen. And so that's your creative purpose. And through the grace that flows from what Jesus has already accomplished and through that at the cross and through that, you will receive an eternal reward. I had a little illustration up here. I was thinking it's kind of like generator power. You know, God created Adam out of an unfallen earth, breathed life into him. And now Adam is created in the image and likeness of God. But after the fall of man, man is born in the image and likeness of Adam. That's Genesis chapter five, verse three. Okay, Seth was born in the image and likeness of Adam. And so man, is, but now when man is born again, it's almost like generator power. You ever seen a house that my neighbor next door got one of those generators, right? When the electricity goes off, the, elect, the electricity from the world goes off, boom, immediately the generator kicks on. Yeah. And it's kind of like before Christ, we're operating under the generator electricity of the world, okay? And then, and then once we come to Christ, that old person that we were in the mind of God dies and immediately a new power source yes. begins to operate and wants to have its way to operate in our lives. Amen? Amen. Look, understanding God's business on earth also requires understanding that God has an enemy. And that's really a big, I'm still in my introduction. We're about to get into some scriptures. But look, I need you to know that you got to understand that God has an enemy in order to be able to see things from God's perspective so that you can join with God and to pray with him that his will on earth would be done. Amen. And, uh, you know, look, I, I don't want to get into this because this could be really, really deep. But I got to tell you that I do believe that something happened between Genesis 1 and Genesis 1, Genesis 1, 1 and Genesis 1, 2. I'm not going to get into all of that, some deep stuff. But the word of God teaches that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. 
And then in verse two, it says, and the earth was without form and void. I'm not going to tell you what I think happened in the middle of that because that's, it's all speculation. But I know this. I, I believe this with all of my heart that the enemy of God fell before the earth that you and I understood stand today was ever created. There was an angelic rebellion. That's the point I'm trying to make to you. Because the word form and void in the Hebrew is tohu bohu. It means chaos and emptiness. Jeremiah the prophet said that God creates nothing in emptiness and chaos. So the point is, is that something somewhere somehow happened. And before this earth was created, I'm telling you there was an angelic rebellion. And I want to introduce you to that idea. You know his name. The Bible calls him Lucifer in the Latin. And now and but we call him Satan, which means the adversary. Yeah. Satan fell because he said that he was going to exalt himself above the throne of God. Pride entered into his heart because of his beauty and his power. And he said, I can do a better job in his heart. And he elevated himself. And because of that, he was cast to the earth. You know, it's understandable that a lot of times people come to church because they need healing in their lives. I know I did. <laughs> that was what got me to come to church. You know what I'm saying? When I first went to church with my sister that night, I'm telling you, my life was a mess. And thank God for you guys. Most of your lives aren't as much of a mess as mine. But, but we still, we need healing, right? We need healing in our lives. And praise God for that. He's still a healer today. And if we'll stay with him, he'll keep healing in us. But one of the things that I have learned is that at some point, it, it, the ongoing work happens. There's a place where I begin to die to myself. Amen. I begin to grow spiritually and I become more focused on what God's doing than myself. You know, this is the part where I think sometimes I probably do kind of like get on people's nerves. But it's not that I want to get on people's nerves. Whenever I say things that I think might get on people's nerves, it's not to do that on purpose, it, but it is to provoke. It is. It, it's, to, it's to provoke. And, 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 and what I'm trying to get at is, is that I have been. See, sometimes when I talk about things that might take place in other churches, it's not because I'm being ugly. It's because I viewed it and maybe I was viewing it from the wrong angle, but this is what I've seen. Sometimes I believe people make decisions on what church they're going to go to because they're single. Because it's a single woman and she wants a husband. The Bible says, the Bible clearly says that a man that finds a wife finds a good thing. So finding a wife if you're a single man is, is a godly thing. It is. That's the scripture. And so vice versa. The Bible clearly says like if a wife finds a good husband, she has found a good thing. So to find a good husband or find a good wife is a good thing. Praise God. But if the motives of your heart deep down here are that I need a man to make my life fulfilled, I need a husband. And so I'm going to choose a church that's filled with husbands, potential husbands or potential wives. And that's really the motives of my heart. And nobody else is even going to know it but between you and the Holy Spirit. But the Holy Spirit will speak to you. And he's trying to show you that you're saying you want to go to a church for another reason. But, but, but no, it's really something else that's deep down. In there. And then I've seen groups of people, uh, you know, and it's kind of like, it's kind of like, girl, where did you get your nails done? <laughs> no, come on, help me out here, girl. Where did you get your nails done? Where did you get your hair done? Because that is what. And and there's like a, and you walk into some of these churches and they're all sitting in a group. Is there anything wrong with getting your nails done? No, of course not. I don't think. I don't know. Take that up with the Lord. Is there anything wrong with getting your hair done? But sometimes these things, if that is the motive, when I walked into a church, I've been ch going to different churches. Y'all know what I'm saying is true. People do these things. I go through, and, and Lord help them because they don't really necessarily know any better. They're just trying to find a place to fit in. I get that. But, but, but they show up and there's a group of women that they, you know what? I like the way that that looks. And, and, then, and then it becomes a social gathering. Now, there might be a church like that that's still where the preacher's preaching truth. Really, what we're supposed to, because there's a lot of people preaching truth. But what we're supposed to do is to find a church where we can grow together in the truth of the gospel. Amen. And that the word of God would have its way in our heart. The reason that I even said all of that stuff is because sometimes we are so caught up in the temporal world. 
And even myself, not even that long ago, dude, I was spending all this money. You know, we can spend money on ridiculousness. Clothing, and we just make such a big deal about things. We need clothes. But these things should not, the temporal world and material possessions will destroy our walk with God if we are not careful. And, then, and we're supposed to be moving towards spiritual, allowing God to move in us spiritually is what I'm trying to say. I said it last week, and I'm, I'm going to say it again. Whenever I get into this message, I want you to think about this. I want you to think about the fact that, that God is engaged in a war. And he's, he's looking for people. He's played, if you're saved this morning, he's put the kingdom of God on the inside right. of you. And if we're not concerned, for the first 12 years of my Christian life, I wanted a son so bad. And you know why I wanted a son? Because I, my, I wanted my son to play football. Uh -huh. <laughs> and I would, I, 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 this is after I was a Christian for 12 years. No, listen, I'm sorry, that's ridiculous. That's ridiculous, that I'm praying for a son that he would play football. That, that is a carnal mind. Yes, sir. That is a earthly mindset. Now, if my son is up playing football right. and he Amen. uses his stage right. like Tim right. Tebow to preach Jesus to a lost and dying world, then a hallelujah. But how many Tim Tebows are there out there? There's a handful in the NFL that are truly living for Jesus. And praise God for that. Praise God for that. But do you get what I'm trying to say? We're over here praying for these kinds of things and God's engaged in a spiritual war. <laughs> and, and, and if he's giving you gifts and he's giving you, giving you opportunities wherever he's placed you, you're supposed to be using the main gift, the kingdom of God on the inside of you to come out of you into the midst of the world that you're living in. And that's what I'm trying to say. Is that unfortunately many times we do. We have churches filled with people that are filling up with, with certain mindsets about certain things. And they're not really hungry to do the work of God. Amen. And we need the Holy Spirit to help us all. I need the Holy Spirit to help me. You need the Holy Spirit to help you. Amen. So here we go. We're getting ready to get into this. So, so in Luke chapter 10, the 72 return. Y'all remember that story? And they returned with joy and they said, Lord, even the demons obey us. Praise God. And then Jesus said this. He said, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. So again, I've brought, I brought already introduced the thought. Satan rebelled in ages of old. And I believe that what Jesus is saying right there, he's saying in my pre, and this, I'm going to use some fancy words, but just hang with me. In my pre-incarnate state as the eternal Word as the eternal Son. That means before Jesus was ever in flesh. Y'all understand what I'm saying? Jesus was God before he was a human being. And he never stopped being God, but Jesus was God before he was ever a human. Jesus, as the Word, according to Colossians and Hebrews, spoke the worlds into existence. Jesus is saying, now in his human form, I saw Satan fall like lightning from the sky. And he was talking about, I believe, before he was ever in human form. The Holy Spirit showed him and reminded him of what he saw as the eternal word of God. And he understands now even a little bit better as he's growing and the Holy Spirit's revealing things to him that this is his purpose on earth to make right what this enemy has made wrong, uh, you know, to the human race. And then they, and, they said, and they said, even the demons are subject. And Jesus said, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. And then Jesus said this, behold, I have given you authority to tread on serpents yeah, yeah, and scorpions. Yeah. The authority, see, it's kind of like what Jesus is saying is this, that the enemy has had his way all this time. And now my entry into this, into this earthly realm is bringing a shift already. Listen, demons obeyed him. Sicknesses were healed just from the presence of Jesus showing up. Things started to change radically before you didn't see that kind of stuff. Yeah, there were demons manifested, but these things knew Jesus. It, whenever they get close to him, they're like, what, what, have you, what are you here before the appointed time to torment us? You're here earlier than what you're supposed to be. And he, and he, and he just starts casting devils out of people. And, and so what Jesus is saying is this, is that 
my presence here is bringing a shift. I saw him when he fell, but now I'm here to tell you I have given you authority over serpents and scorpions. I'm pretty sure that Christian Matt, after 12 years, was not still supposed to be praying that he'd have a son to play football. Whenever, and, and, and listen, if you're praying for your son to play football, praise God. And, and keep praying for your son to play football, but please, also let's pray that, that the Lord would, would do a work on earth. That the Lord would work in us and through us, amen? And that we would get our mind focused on the spiritual things that are going on, right? And so, so this is what God wants you and I to be able to see. And that was my intro, for us to be able to see what God sees, right? And, and, he, and he showed the, the disciples what they were able to do through his power. And he wants you and I to see what we're able to accomplish through the power of God. But listen, there's an enemy of God. And in 2 Corinthians, I want you to put this up on the uh, screen. I'm using the ESV version this morning. And if, if need be, I'll share with you some of the King James words because I know some of y'all like some of those words better. ESV is a, is a literal translation. It's a word-for-word -word translation. Um, so we're going to go to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 1 through 4. Because we're, we're talking about being able to see. And, and, and this, is, this is the Apostle Paul writing a letter to the Corinthian church. He said, therefore, having this ministry by the mercy of God. Now, it, you'd have to go to the chapter before, but let me just tell you. He's talking about the ministry of teaching people about the righteousness of God. Amen. That's the ministry God had given. Him. And he says, so by therefore having this ministry by the mercy of God, we do not lose heart. We have, but we have renounced disgraceful underhanded ways. Look at that. We have renounced disgraceful underhanded ways. We refuse to practice cunning or to tamper with God's word. But by the open statement of the truth, we would commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. And look at this, verse 3. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers. Now, I'm just going to stop right there. And, and, and I want you to think about that. Because, I listen, I've had a lot of conversations with a lot of believers through the years. It doesn't mean that I've exhausted everything. But I'm telling you, half the time when somebody says, yeah, but he's talking about unbelievers right there, Pat. Matt. He's talking about unbelievers, so this isn't talking to the church. But hold on a second. Do you honestly believe in these days that the world has not been filled, that the church has not been filled with the worldly, that the church has not been filled with unbelievers? Do you honestly, can we say, no, as a matter of fact, the word of God says that in the last days, people would depart from the faith and that they would give heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. I'm not trying to say that every church around the corner is doing that. I'm just trying to tell you what the Bible says. And it says that, you know, that they will, you get it, right? And so this is what I'm trying to say. Do we believe that people in church are not affected by this? Do we believe that preachers have not been affected by this? That their eyes have been blinded to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. I'm still talking to you about being able to see what God sees. Amen. So if we ask for light and we could see if the veil was removed and we could see what God sees, what would we see? And then once we saw it, how would we pray? If you could see what God sees, if you saw it, how would you pray, right? So let, let, go to Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 2, and you can just keep it on this particular translation. He says this, and I want you, I want you to, I'm not going to read all of these passages, but I'm starting to get into the scriptures of what I want you to see that God sees. He says, and you were dead in trespasses and sins. Over there, yeah, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1 and 2. <clears throat> verse 1, and you were dead. And you were dead in trespasses and sins in which you once walked following the course of the world. Now, some of you remember vividly where you used to be before you knew Jesus, right? If you haven't received Christ, you, you can have an opportunity today to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior. But what it says is this. He's preaching. He's writing a letter to Christians. He said, you used to walk and follow the course of the world. And when you were doing that, 
whether you realize it or not, you were following the prince of the power of the air. Who's that talking about? That's talking about the devil, which is the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. So the Bible teaches that there's a powerful spirit that's operating in the in the spiritual atmosphere that's driving. I had an illustration and I decided to take it out, but I think I'm going to say it. Imagine, imagine a cowboy, a bunch of cowboys are driving a herd of animals towards a cliff and they're just driving them off of the cliff. And it almost looks like there's no apparent reason. Why would you just kill all this cattle like this? It just, it's just no apparent reason on why you do that. Because you're just, you just flipping through the channels and you see this and you see these cowboys are driving these cattle Oh man, what a waste, right? Why would you do this? And so it doesn't make any sense. Well, the Bible teaches that broad is the way, wide is the gate that leads to destruction. The prince of the power of the air is working in the children of disobedience and he's driving them over a cliff towards destruction, right? But if you got the backstory on the film, what you might realize is that there's two ranchers that are feuding, right? One's a powerful rancher that has a bunch of cattle. The other one's a wicked rancher and he's trying to take over all of the land. And what he's doing is he's trying to drive the good rancher's cattle off because he's trying to take over. He's trying to bring destruction. And, and, and in reality, that's exactly what the enemy's trying to do. He, is he going to be successful? No. But he wants to steal what belongs to to God. And what I want you to know is this, is that this enemy is moving in the children of disobedience through this powerful spirit. Just bear with me because we're, we shouldn't be too long now. Now I want you to get to Psalm chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. And I want you to see what this psalm says. It says, it says, why do the nations rage? Psalm chapter 2, and we're going to read verses 1 through 3 to start with. Why do the nations rage? And the people's plot in vain. Now, the King James says the heathen. Why do the heathen rage? Well, what does the word heathen mean? It means people that don't know God. Okay, let's just keep it simple. Why do the nations filled with people that don't know God? See, everybody separate from Israel back then really didn't know God as a nation. And, and this psalmist who comes from Israel is saying, why do these heathen nations rage and the people plot in vain? So they're making a plot. They're making a plan. You get that. Look what it says. The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together. So powerful people. Listen, we don't have a lot of kings left. I think there's a king in, in Saudi Arabia and there's still a, and there's a king in England. Okay, we won't get into that. That'd be a whole, that'd be a whole teaching right there. All right, yeah. So there's, but, but, but there are rulers. There's rulers all over the earth. And what the psalmist is saying is that they're taking counsel together. Now, you may think that I'm a little bit crazy before this message is over with, but I'm about to, I'm, I'm about to say some things that you may not agree with or you may agree with, but I'm going to say it. I'm trying to tell you that there are powerful people on the earth still today that are taking counsel together and they're trying to do this very thing. They're trying to plot in vain. They're making a plan. They set themselves against God. They take counsel together against the Lord. And look at that, against his anointed. Who do you think that's talking about? Because let me just tell you this. This psalm was written about 1000 B.C. 1,000 years before Jesus was ever born, this psalm was written. And it's saying right here that the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and his anointed. You know what the word anointed means? It means Messiah. If you look this up in the Hebrew, I wish I had time to tell you all about a Muslim woman I, I witnessed to for, for quite a little while at the clinic the other day. But I don't have time. You know what? We have a Bible study on Sunday nights. We're going to have Bible study tonight. It's a good time for people to interject and to, and to give comments. And to ask questions. So if you can make it tonight at 5. Maybe we'll get into that too. That was an amazing opportunity. Because I learned some things that I never knew. Okay. But look. I guess it's anointed. The plan of the rulers of the world. Is to come against God. And to come against his anointed. Which we know now was Jesus. Right. right? And, and, and look what they do. This is what they say. The, the, saying, let us burst their bond, their bonds apart. Let, can, let us cast away their cords from us. So basically they're saying we don't like the rulership of God. We don't like the rulership of his anointed one. We want to break free from his sovereignty. We, that's, that is the spirit of Lucifer. That is the spirit of Satan. That is the very verbiage that he used when he went to the garden. In the day that you eat thereof, surely you will not die, but you will know and you will become as gods. 
The very thing that he injected in Adam and Eve is the same thing that we're seeing in this passage of Scripture. And it's the same spirit of rebellion that tries to speak to you and I when we go against what we know to be God's word. He's saying, surely you're not going to die if you go do this, this, or this. Surely it's going to be okay if you just do what you want and you just live your... That is a spirit of pride at the root. My friend, it is not okay for us to rebel against the word of the Lord. All right? Let me just say that. He who sits in the heavens, you don't have to go to there. You can go to six. But it says this, he who sits in the heavens laughs. And in verse six, he says this, as for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. I feel like I have to talk about some of these things. You know, Zion is a hill inside the city of Jerusalem. And it's upon which the temple was built. And, and whenever it says that, you know, the psalmist is the king here. This is David writing this psalm. But this is prophetic. Because there's, the Bible also says, and we'll be teaching this Wednesday night because it's the second part of Hebrews chapter 12. There's a heavenly Zion. There's a heavenly Zion with an innumerable amount of angels and the spirits of just men made perfect. And that is the eternal reward of where you're going because you're a pilgrim on this earth if you're a true believer of God and you're supposed to be looking to a city that's fountain that's builder and maker was God and not a city upon this earth and the people around you may not agree with you but I'm here to tell you right here he's saying I have set my king upon Zion my holy hill and guess what the word of God says that Jesus is going to rule and reign from the throne of David. God is not done working on this earth and it is going to come to its fulfillment and Jesus is going to rule on this earth. But the enemy is 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 called is, is putting the spirit of disobedience on people and he's moving together with the rulers of the earth. But the Lord says, I have put my king on the earth. Look at verse seven, the last part of verse seven. He says this, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will make the nations your heritage. The King James Version says your inheritance and the ends of the earth, your possession. You will break them with a rod of iron. You will dash them to pieces like a potter's vessel. Now, therefore, O kings, be wise, be warned, O rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and tremble. You know, I wanted to tell you, I, I, don't, I didn't put it in here, but I believe it's Revelation chapter 2. It talks about he that overcomes. Yeah. It talks about he that overcomes that he is going to be given a rod to also rule under the authority of Jesus. The Bible clearly teaches that those that follow the Lord on this side. See, this is why I'm preaching this to you. Whether or not, whether or not you can keep up with me, whether or not, listen, the reason I'm preaching this to you is because the prayer of my heart is that when you take your last breath here and you take your first breath in glory that you will hear the words well done my good and faithful servant and I'm trying I'm trying to help people the best I know how through the word of God to understand that there is something so much bigger than this physical realm that we're living in and I know it's hard because carnality means we live according to our senses and everything we see everything we hear and the Lord help us if we purposely put our eyes on things that, that draw us in, put, let our ears hear things that draw us in, instead of hearing the word of God and seeing the word of God, we cause damage to ourselves because we let the world speak to us and the message of the world is pulling us. I don't know how else to do it other than to say, I, I'm trying to get people's attention. I'm trying to let people know that this stuff is serious. That this stuff is serious. And if I stand before God one day and I didn't do what I was supposed to do, I will be held accountable that I did not let people know that God is in a war and he's looking for people that are going to die to themselves and he's looking for people that are going to let the Holy Spirit live on the inside of them and he's looking for people that will release the Holy Spirit of their life to give to others, to let the seed of the gospel to go forward and to engage in the battle of life to join God and to see what God sees. Amen. Provoke us, Lord. Provoke us. And, and you're going to be given a rod. If you're an overcomer, those that overcome are going to be given a rod to rule the nations. They sing a song. 
He has redeemed us with his blood from every tongue and tribe and nation. Hallelujah. He has made us to be kings and priests unto our God. Here he goes again. How does a man that prays that his son plays football and not understand the things of God hear those words? Well done, my good and faithful servant. How will he be given the title of a king and a priest in the millennial reign of Christ to live for the Lord, to serve God in that way, if he spent his whole life on earth worried about his own material possessions, worried about his own finances, worried about his own whatever stuff. No, Lord, help us. It doesn't work that way. It doesn't, it doesn't work that way. I'm trying to tell you that's not what the Word of God says. It, 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 the Word of God been now. If you will seek His righteousness and His kingdom first. Seek his kingdom and his righteousness first. Then what? Hallelujah. All these other things shall be added unto you. Hallelujah. Seek him, his kingdom and his righteousness first. And he's going to take care of you. There's blessing in the word of God. There's prosperity in the word of God. There's, oh, Lord Jesus, what do you need from him? He just wants you to get involved with him. He just wants you to work with him. He'll, he'll bless you. He'll heal you. He'll heal your mind. When your heart was broken and all scarred up, because maybe Pastor Matt did something wrong, Lord, forgive me if I did something wrong. But he'll heal you. He will heal your heart. If you'll let him. Yes. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. All right. So now I want to make a connection for you. So what did we talk about? We talked about... The sons of disobedience. We talked about the prince of the power of the air. And then we talked about the rulers taking counsel together, right? We talked about powerful people being under the influence of the enemy and under the influence of, the, of, the, of an evil spirit, right? So now I'm going to make a connection between the prince of the power of the air and, the, and working in the children of disobedience and these rulers trying to break free from God's authority. And I'm about to say something that you may not agree with, but you might, some of you might really agree with me, some of you might not. But I want to try to bring it to your real time and here we go in 2008 Katy Perry produced a song called I kissed a girl and I liked it okay her dad was a preacher Katy Perry's dad was a preacher and she produced a song I kissed a girl and I liked it that was in 2008 how many years has that been 12 plus 3 is 15 2008 and then in 2014 Miley Cyrus who our children grew up Watching the Hannah Montana show. And I know that our children grew up because my, ch my daughter wanted watching it. And I let her watch it. And one day I had, a, the Lord tried to speak to me one day when I was walking through the living room. It was just a little symptom. I was walking through the living room and I said, wait, why? She was, she was back talking Billy Ray or, or whoever her daddy was. On, was he, yeah. 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 Back talking her daddy on television, on, on the show. You know, being sassy like teenagers do. And I said, well, hold on a second. Stop that. I, do you see how that girl just talked to her daddy? You, you are not supposed to talk to me that way. Now, I'm not telling you I did everything right, but I'm just telling you I stopped the show. And then I said, all right, man, you can keep watching. <laughs> all right. But did I know that behind the scenes was brewing? Can I, can, I'm going to tell you this. I'm going to look in the camera and I'm going to say, brewing a diabolical plan? Right. Could it be that we're under such... Are you a conspiracy theorist, preacher? Yeah. I'm trying to ask you a question. Do you think that it's possible that the devil... Is, first of all, you've got to ask yourself a question. Do you believe the devil is real? I don't need you to answer me. I'm just asking you. You can just keep your poker face on. And I'm going to ask the question. Do you believe the devil is real? And you have to calculate in your brain right now. Yes or no. It's all it is. You know, I don't need you to answer me. Yes or no. Do you believe the devil is real? All right. And then, if you believe he's real, do you believe that he has power on earth? Yes or no? Jesus said he has power on earth. Okay. He told Jesus I got power on earth. He said it was delivered to me. I took Adam's authority. Okay, but in Christ, we've given authority back. But, but listen, do you believe if he's real? Do you believe that he has got power? Do you believe he's smarter than you? Oh, come on. Come on. And do you believe that if men can create schemes, that the devil can't do it better? And do you believe based on the scripture that there's a spirit, the prince of the power of the air working in the children of disobedience? And do you believe that there's still rulers on earth, 
powerful people that can make decisions to cause a shift in culture around us. Because I can promise you 14 years ago, homosexuality did not have the freedom that it does today. And two Christian girls that were raised in the church supposedly... One whose daddy was a preacher, and the other one who Billy Ray Cyrus openly confessed and professed Christianity. On 2014, Miley has her coming out party, and she gets on MTV Awards, and her and Katy Perry lock lips not only there, but also in a concert, and she says, I just kissed a girl, and I think I really liked it. All these girls that sat under watching Hannah Montana all of these years and grew up on Hannah Montana were just baptized into the thought of lesbianism. Don't tell me that it didn't happen. It's rampant in the schools. It's everywhere that you turn now. And they think that people like me are haters. And I'm here to tell you, I'm not a hater. I'm a lover of the souls of people. I'm a lover of God. And I'm here to tell you that people are falling headlong under deception. I'm here to tell you that we're engaged in a spiritual war. I'm here to tell you that the devil fell and God is engaged in war. And I'm here to tell you that God is not a Okay, for me to be preaching, for me to be only be praying that my son would play football one day, or that my daughter would make the cheer team. Hallelujah! If you make the cheer team, you better preach Jesus. If you make the football team, you better preach Jesus. If you love Jesus, if God, you better not get taken down in that world. In that world that's talking about fingernails and hairdos. You better not get taken down in that world that's consumed with the cars that people drive. You better not get ca caught up in that world, my friend. You need to stay grounded in the truth of the gospel. That Jesus died. That people could have life. That they would, that they would learn the truth. What's going to happen if we don't believe the truth? What's going to happen if people just reject God's truth? Are they going to get in because they were good people? It's not going to happen like that. It's not what the word says. And so people reject the word because it doesn't fit in with their narrative. Lord, help us. What's going to change this? So now you see what we're up against, if you believe that. If you don't believe it, it's fine. You know, we'll just keep it. So I believe that that was purposefully planned. I believe that was purposefully planned. They both had a connection to Disney. I don't know. We ain't going there. I've been to Disney. Who, Lord knows, I might go again. They got some cool rides. But I can promise you right now, I ain't preaching Disney. If I preach, I'll be preaching against it. But anyway, let's not get into that. This is what we're up against. And so my question is, what's going to fix it? Well, I have three things down here. Well, two questions real quick. Is voting going to fix this? Hmm. Is it good to have a man of God or, or a good person? Okay, let's, a man of God. How we even find it? Is it good to have a person? And yes. Should we vote? Yes. But is voting going to fix this problem? Absolutely not. But yet we have a majority of the church thinking that the voting booth is what's going to fix it. We have Christians all over the world trying to get into politics, thinking that they're going to fix this problem because of the degradation of society. And my question is, as much time as we're spending, we're not spending a lot of time in the voting booth, obviously, but the question is, how much time are we spending in the prayer closet? No, no, I'm here to provoke you. I'm here to provoke myself. Not only that you will pray for your own life, your own finances, your own things that are going on, your own children. And listen, I pray for those things. But also that we would join and partner with God in the midst of what is going on and that we would understand that we have power on earth. This earth was created for you to have power and dominion on because it was created for Adam to do that. And we've been given power and dominion back. And the Lord's looking for a body. The Lord is looking for a body with a mouth that will declare the truth of God, that will pray the truth of God, that will combat the ways of the world and the wickedness of the enemy. That's what he's looking for. I understand that not everybody's not everybody sees it the way you do, preacher. I, I get that. I, not everybody has been in it as long as you. I get that. But at the same time, we need to be growing. That's right, yeah. We need to be growing towards the truth. Amen. I want to say, no, what about prayer? Will prayer change things? I believe it will. Matter of fact, I want you to see this. Psalm 149. We'll look at verses 5 through 9. 
It says, that, I, say, I wanted to say this, prayer by the saints will affect the nations and the world we live in. I believe this. Psalm 149 verse 5 says this. Let the godly exult in glory. Let them sing for joy on their beds. Let the high praises of God be in their throats and a two-edged sword in their hands. Hallelujah. Yes. Huh? Hallelujah. Let the high praises of God be in their throats and a two-edged sword in their hands. I'm talking about an army of praisers. I'm talking about an army of people that would desire to exalt the Lord and be ready for battle. You, you listen, we're not going to win this war with swords and bullets and guns. This, this war is going to have to be won on our knees and in the preparation of our own hearts to be ready for whatever lies ahead. I'm going to leave it like that. But look what it says in verse 7, though. To execute vengeance on the nations and punishment on the people. You remember how in the Psalm 2 it said that they wanted to break the chains, right? They said, we're going to break the chains and cast the cords off of us of the Lord and His anointing. But look at verse 8. When we pray, this is what it says. Let the high praises of God be in their throats, two-edged sword in their hands. Why? To execute vengeance on the nations, uh, to bind their kings with chains and their nobles with fetters of iron. What I'm trying to tell you is this. I believe this. That it matters for you and I as the people of God to begin to learn how to pray. To first of all in our own home to take time in intimate prayer. To make a connection to the Lord. Listen, Jesus died on the cross so that you could have access to the throne room of God. And God wants you to spend time in his presence. Sometimes it starts off as five minutes, ten minutes. Whatever you can give the Lord, give the Lord. Amen. Just give him something and try to make it come from your spirit. Try to make a connection to the Lord from your spirit. And cry out to him and say, Lord, I know that I haven't always been right. But won't you do a work in my heart? Lord, I want to be right. Thank you for the cross. Lord, have your way in me. Change me, Lord. Let me see. Let me see what you're doing, Lord. Yes, bless my children, Lord. Please protect my children. You get it, right? Take care. Use me at work, Lord. Make me the best worker that they have. Make me productive, Lord. Bless my employer, Lord. Make my, my attitude right. And also, Lord, use me whenever I'm over there. Use me for your kingdom, Lord. And you pray these things individually, but then we also enter in to, and we join with God. He's looking for a body that he can place his head on. He's looking for a mouth that will declare and speak the truth of his word into this atmosphere. That we, that we would take authority and we would see God begin to shake and to change people's lives that might not be right. And, and that God would help them to wake up. Amen. Praise God. I believe that that's good right there. All right. So I got a couple more concepts for you. Revelation chapter 12. You can go to verse 1. But, but, but what I want to just tell you is a story. This is a sign that appeared in heaven. And now, I don't want to get into the, to the uh, eschatology of this. What, that's a fancy word that means end time teaching. I don't want to get, I believe that this, this is the most intriguing chapter to me in the whole Bible. Revelation chapter 12 is amazing to me. It's like a puzzle that I have not unlocked and it drives me crazy. <laughs> Where I have gotten to is this. I believe it's multi-layered. That's my opinion. I can't prove it to you, but I believe it's multi-layered. I believe it talks about the birth of Jesus, but I also believe it's a sign of the rapture. And, I, and, I, and, I, and, and there's various reasons that I believe that. I'm not trying to get into that, but I just want you to know that, that it's, it's such an intriguing chapter. So it says in, in verse 1, it says, and I'm just kind of talking, it says that there was a woman and she was clothed with the sun and the moon was under her feet and she had a crown of 12 stars. Now the Catholic Church will teach you that that's Mary. Now, but I'm telling you that in Genesis, I believe that we're clearly told Joseph had a dream. And Joseph had a dream and that the moon and the sun bowed down to him and also the 12 stars and it was connected to his family. Because see, Joseph was part of the 12 tribes of Israel. Rachel would have been represented by the moon. So this is a picture really of Israel. And it was a picture of the nation of Israel through which was given the world Jesus for the plan of God. Okay, But I personally believe that this, this vision right here, the fulfillment of it on earth is actually taking place at a mid-trib point. That's my particular opinion. Look, it says she was pregnant. All right. And it says that she was crying in birth pains. And it says, look, and then here's another character in verse 3, that there was a red dragon. What do you think that is? That's the devil, right? 
And, and he had seven heads and ten horns. We don't really have time to get into that. But look, it also says in verse 4 that he took a third of the stars of heaven and he cast them to the earth. That's where most, most preachers say that a third of the angels fell with Satan when he fell. And, she, and, and, then, and then I want you to keep going. To go to verse 7. It says, now war arose in heaven. Michael and his angels fighting against the dragon. The dragon and his angels fought back, but he was defeated. And there was no longer any place for them in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down, that ancient serpent. That's interesting though, right? The Bible right here tells us that he started off as a serpent in the garden. And at the end, he's a dragon. He gained a lot of power. He grew up into a really ugly thing. Right And man, man allowed it, in a sense. Man allowed this to happen. Yes. Who is called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth. His angels were thrown down with him. And I heard a loud <laughs> voice saying, Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come. Now listen, I want you to think about this for a second. First of all, Jesus says, I saw Satan cast to the earth like lightning. And that was, I believe, what he was saying is I saw that when I was the word before I was in human flesh. And then he said when it, to his disciples, they said, the, even the demons listen to us. The authority of God has come upon this earth. You understand that things are happening. God, Satan tried to rebel against God in heaven. That ain't going to work. That's not going to work. Foop, you're out of here, right? But then, but then now in Jesus, he's starting to take it back. I wish I had time to really talk. I know I talk too much. But look, listen, I, I said this a while back, and I think it's so profound. The, God gave this earth to Adam and for humanity. I know I've said that before. The enemy is trying to take it away from God. But God shows up. Listen, this is so powerful. And if you've never read the Bible, you don't even know what I'm talking about. And I don't mean that other. I'm just saying. God found a man, Abraham. Come out of your father's house. I'm going to make you a great nation. And through that man, he never even saw the promise, but he believed God. And through that one man, he gave the world Israel. And it's almost like he said, right here on this little sliver of land, I'm taking this earth back. One piece at a time. One person at a time. And I'm just looking for some people that will work with me. I'm just looking for some people that will believe me according to my word. And from that land right there, he gave the world Jesus. And through the death of Jesus, Jesus said, I planted myself into the ground like a seed. Because a seed starts a harvest. And if a seed remains alone, it doesn't produce anything. But if it would die, it would produce a great harvest. And now this world is filled with people that are believers. What I'm trying to tell you is, is that God is taking this earth back one piece at a time. And the question for people to know is this. Are we going to be part of what he's doing? Are we going to be part? Uh, so now, but now at, at the end right here, it's done. It, it, it's almost done. The, the accuser of the brethren now has been cast to the earth because he's been accusing them day and night. He's been accusing the believers day and night. But listen, they, they, they conquered him or they overcame him by the blood of the lamb. That's verse 11. By the word of their testimony, for they loved not their own lives even unto death. Nobody in America likes this kind of message. But if you were in Syria and you took your American self to Syria... Or if, yeah, if you took your American self to Syria and you felt like you were a missionary to Syria and you preached Jesus and hot Hezbollah heard that you were preaching Jesus and, and took you and, and killed you for the cause of Christ. Because there's people over there that are dying right now. Y'all understand that, right? And, and y'all understand that the disciples died that way, right? Okay. And you, we took our American self over there and yet we, we, we have a hard time... And I'm not, I don't mean this to make you feel bad. Lord, please help me. I don't want you to think I'm trying to make you feel bad, but it's to the point that we have a hard time telling people that we love Jesus which sometimes. And I've been there. Amen. I've been there. What I'm trying to say, though, is how will we, how will you stand? How will we stand in the last days? And listen, that's another thing I want to say. I don't have to, I feel like we're nearing the last days. I feel like we're in the last days. 
And, and I feel like God's told me that this is the kind of thing that I have to talk about. Another preacher is going to focus on healing. Another preacher is going to focus on deliverance. Another preacher is going to focus on whatever he's going to focus on. And that's all powerful stuff and things that God has done. And another preacher is going to focus on salvation. And what the Lord's told me is I need you to be able to preach all of it. But I need you to focus on this. Because we're in the last days. And it's time for my people to wake up. And it's time for them to be ready. Get yourself ready is what I'm trying to say. Amen. What I'm trying to say. Amen. You know, Paul said, to, to speed it up a little bit, that we're not, we're not in a wrestling match against flesh and blood. We're, we're wrestling against principalities and powers and spiritual wickedness in heavenly places. Yes. Uh -huh. See, in your individual life, when you go to work tomorrow, and old boy, like, clowns you and makes you feel low, or, you know, something happens where somebody is rude to you, and you feel irritated, just try to remember, I'm preaching to the preacher. Just try to remember, you're not in a fight with a human being. The enemy's trying to get you, met. that's for your individual life. You're not fighting human beings, you're fighting the enemy wants to throw you off. Okay, but in a big picture, we got to understand that that's what we're fighting. The enemy wants to destroy our faith in God, right? And he, and he said that you're not in that war. Now the last thing I want to talk to you about as a matter of fact, we can go ahead and get the singers and musicians to come and they can get a little comfortable as they get to their spots. But I want you to see this. If you could put up Daniel chapter 10, verse 13, verse 12. Daniel chapter 10, verse 12. Because I want you, I want you to try to see the, the, this kind of, sometimes a lot of preachers don't really talk about these kinds of things. Because they don't feel like it's important, you know, and they, maybe they're right. Maybe they, maybe they're doing, I don't know. That's not what the Lord's telling me, but Dan, I want you to know that Daniel's prophecy is warning us about what was going to come at the end. As a matter of fact, earlier in the chapter, he, Daniel said, I was, you don't have to turn to it, but he said, I was mourning for three weeks. I did not eat any delicacies, no meat. No wine entered my mouth. He was fasting. I did not anoint myself for full, three full weeks. On the 24th day of the first month, I was standing on the bank of the great river, the Tigris. I lifted up my eyes and I looked and behold, a man clothed in linen with a belt of fine gold was around his waist. He said to me, fear not, Daniel, for from the first day that you set your heart to understand and humbled yourself your, before your God, your words have been heard. And I have come because of your words. So what, what's happening here is that Daniel now has been a captive in Babylon. Okay, he's been, he's, he was taken captive. The Babylonian Empire, do you understand what that means? That means like the Chinese would have showed up and ripped your children out of school. Oh, that's the best way I know how to describe it. The Chinese government showed up, they parachuted in, and they took your children out of school and they took them back with them to China. And now Daniel is in a prison at first. And they're trying to get him to conform to the new ways. And Daniel says, no, I'm not going to eat the food. Now, this is early on. I'm not going to eat that. I'm not going to drink that. I'm going to serve my God. No matter where I am, no matter what I'm doing. And then now, he's been elevated. And he's fasting. Because he's praying that God would reveal to him things that have to do with his own people, right? He's because his own people have to do with the big plan of God, right? And so he's praying and he fasts for these three weeks. And now what happened is this angel shows up. This angel shows up and says, when you first started praying, your prayers were heard. But look what he says in verse 13. The prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me. Now you understand who's talking to him. This is the angel Gabriel talking to Daniel. The angel Gabriel showed up to give Daniel an answer. I want you to get this in your mind because this isn't a fairy tale. This isn't a comic book. This is the Bible and this is the Word of God. And, and that when a, the angel Gabriel showed up and said, listen, when you first started praying, your prayers were heard. But look, the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me. You, you think that that was the Shah of Iran? Do you think that that was a, a religious leader and a, a human being? No, 
That's not what that's talking about. That's talking about in Ephesians when it said you don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but principalities and powers and spiritual wickedness in heavenly places. He's talking about a fallen angel that's over the region of Persia. He says that the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me for 21 days, but Michael, do y'all know who Michael is? Who's Michael? The archangel of what nation? Israel. That's that's who Michael is in the Bible. He's the archangel of Israel. We're talking about angels right now. Angels resisted the answers to Daniel's prayer. Gabriel said, I was coming to give you the answer to your prayer, but I couldn't because I was resisted by the prince of Persia. And until Michael, look what it goes on to say, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me for I was left there with the kings of Persia. He was stuck. In the spirit realm, I need you to understand this. I'm, I'm going to fail you if I don't at least explain this to you. In the spirit realm, there's a, there's a war raging. There's a war raging. Listen to me. I'm telling you right now what I'm telling you is true. There's a war raging and half of the time we as Christians, and listen, Pastor Matt's been guilty of it. We sit in our chairs, in our recliners. We flip through the channels. God got this. God's got this, man. It's all going to pan out in the end. It's all okay. I'm just going to sit back and live my life. And I know that in the end, he's got this. I'm here to tell you that that is not how the world wants us to live our life. The Lord wants us to understand that there is a spiritual battle that is raging in the heavenly realm. Yes. This message is not going to be for everyone. Not everybody's going to want to hear this kind of preaching. But I'm here to tell you that I believe it with all of my heart that this is what we are truly dealing with. And that if we are going to yoke ourselves with the Lord, we have to understand that prayer and continuing to war in the spirit realm whether we realize it or not, whether we feel like it or not, stand in faith for our children. Oh, our children are so important. My children, oh Lord, my children are so important. <laughs> to stand in faith for our children. To stand in faith that we don't have to live defeated. We don't have to live defeated. The Holy Spirit lives on the inside of you. Jesus has already healed us. He's healed our hearts. He's healed our minds. He's given us a new identity. He's healed us from the spirit of depression. He wants us to, to rise up and to be free so that we can join God in the warfare, amen, of the kingdom. He said, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me for I was left there with the kings of Persia. And he says in verse uh, 20, but no, I'm sorry, look at verse 14. He said, and came to make you understand. This is what I'm coming for, Daniel. <coughs> to make you understand what is to happen to your people in the latter days. Now, some people, I'm, I'm telling you, it's a sad thing, but some people are like, okay, he came to speak to Daniel about his people in the latter days. Okay, this is all for Israel. I don't need to hear that. And I'm telling you, I've had conversations with people, oh, he's talking to Israel. I used to do that. I'd be offshore, read the Bible. The law in Romans. Reading the Bible in the book of Romans when I first was a Christian, saved, and would see the word law and say, well, he's not talking to me because I heard that the law ain't for me. Put it to the side. Never even learned what the Apostle Paul was trying to teach me in the book of Romans about the law and what it can do to me and what it did for me. You, you understand what I'm trying to say? No, we need to dig into this word and we need to learn it. And look at Daniel chapter 20. He said the vision is for the days yet to come. God wants to release truth. And, and Daniel had a part to that truth of what's going to happen in the end days. And God wants to get you and I prepared for what's going to happen in the end days. Amen. And in verse 20, he said this. Then he said, do you know why I've come to you? But now I will return to fight against the prince of Persia. And when I go out, behold, the prince of Greece will come. In other words, we've got another battle to engage. I believe the prayers of the saints make a difference in all of us. I believe that. I don't know if you believe it with me or not, but I believe the prayer of the saints makes a difference. And that all this has happened in there, and that he's given us all this power right here, and that he wants us to believe and to engage. Amen? Listen, maybe you're here 
this morning. I'm closing my eyes. You can close your eyes if you feel like it. You don't have to. I don't know every single person in this place. But if you came in here this morning and you would say in your heart, I've, I've never been born again. I've never received Jesus as my Lord and Savior. If that's you and you want to pray a prayer, because I'm not even going to ask anybody to come forward. I'm just asking you. If that's you, if you could just raise your hand and just signify that, that, you, that you feel in your heart that you need to receive Jesus as your Lord. Well, look, if you've never received Jesus as your Lord, and you said, no, I don't want to make my hands on you, but I'm going to ask you, please, no one to let right now, if you've never received Jesus as your Lord and Savior, or if you're, if you're uncertain, receive Jesus. Maybe you're watching on video and you've never received Jesus. I want to encourage you to right now just lift your hands to heaven. All across this room, I want you to lift your hands if you're surrendered to Jesus. Just lift your hands to heaven and say, Father, thank you for sending Jesus. Thank you for sending me, Jesus. Jesus, I invite you. I invite you to my heart.